So we're just talking offline a little bit about reading and writing and (laughs) managing this flood of information that we live with in the digital age. Uh, So Jeffrey, is there anything that you do on a regular basis when it comes to your habits for reading, writing, uh, daily practices, morning rituals, any advice you could give to us aspiring polymaths about how to uh, uh, strive for the highest well, echelon? Boy, that's it's actually a very challenging question, really, and it touches a certain nerve because um, I, I'm sort of a, uh, I would say, one of the things I discovered uh, late in life uh, was that I have a sort of version of ADD. Mm. Um, you know, I don't, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm obviously I couldn't do the sort of work that I did in terms of, you know, long calculations where you have to stay up to two or three in the morning and you're trying to make sure you got it right. And it's sometimes those calculations to get them correct take uh, several months, you know, of, of really hard work. And you make, you go on lots of blind alleys and lot, make lots of mistakes and eventually you get it all right. And that does require great discipline. I mean, obviously to stay focused and so on. On the other hand, I have this other part of my life where I'm rather undisciplined and that's, I, I use the word ADD. I mean, mm. that's, not, that's not technically, but, but you know, I, I, I don't stay focused on things when I read them and so on. And even when I'm working in a disciplined way, I often uh, take breaks and so on and uh, do something mindless. And I find that that surprisingly helps me. Um, So um, I I don't have a routine per se. Um, I did when I wrote my book, I I don't know if we discussed this last time or when we were earlier, but um, when I, um, when I agreed to write this book, um, it was supposed to be delivered in um, something like uh, two and a half, three years. It was quite a, quite a good grace period, so to speak. And um, I tried to write it by fitting it in to the sort of crevices in my daily work. And that turned out to be a disaster. You know, I, I mean, it was, you know, I do a bit here and a bit there, and it was truly ADD. I mean, that was, it was, and after two years, I realized that uh, this was terrible. And uh, one of the things that professional writers, some of whom are quite famous, that I know said to me, um, you know, the only way to really write a book is you have to dedicate time. You do have to be disciplined. And the, the kind of one of the consistent pieces of advice is, of advice I got was that what you should do is every morning just start writing, just set a time from now to noon or whatever, write. And even if it's sort of terrible, just keep writing. That's how, and you will eventually get it. Mm-hmm. Well, I tried that. Well, well, the first thing I did was that after these two years, I realized trying to just fit it in, you know, late in the afternoon or in a break in the morning was hopeless. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so uh, I decided if I'm going to write this book, um, I will. I made a commitment that every morning, indeed, so, so to speak, after breakfast, I would sit and write till noon, and, and I would not commit myself to anything else during the mornings. Now, of course, sometimes you have to break that uh, of, of those things that might happen and so on. But I did that, and I tried this methodology that uh, many writers use of just writing and not being worried. Well, I discovered I'm very bad at that. I can't do that. And I'm, I'm sort of, what I discovered was something I sort of knew that I'm a totally unwarranted perfectionist. That is, I write a sentence or two and I don't like it and I change it and I change it again and I go back and I do, and it's sort of like ridiculous in a way. It's totally unwarranted, but that's the way I work. And I, I think I do that in my science to some extent. But um, so I adopted that and I came to terms with, yes, nine to 12 is dedicated to this book, to doing this project. Um, and some days uh, at noon, 
I would discover that I'd written basically one or two sentences only. You know, I mean, I'd written lots of stuff, but basically it all boiled down to these two sentences that I'd gone over and over, <coughs> et cetera. I mean, other days I would write several paragraphs and so on. And I came to terms with the fact that it didn't matter. But as long as I keep doing that, and in fact, so one, one of the things I discovered in this, that it was crucially important in writing a book like, like this, that um, I do make, uh, I, I am disciplined. And uh, I do spend, I do dedicate a certain time. Now, that's not how I did my science, and not how I do my science. I do my science um, more in this crevasse, crevice way that I fit it, you know, I do it here and I do it there. And I sometimes I spend several hours on one thing, sometimes just 10 minutes. Sometimes I find, and this was something very important to me, uh, that uh, the, some of the best work conceptually, not in terms of the writing or solving equations and so on, was out walking, was just going for long hikes on my own and just letting my mind relax and all kinds of interesting ideas pop into my head. And that, that was a crucial part. And I think one of the one of the things that I have learned over the years is that that's associated with that is having what you might consider downtime. Um, that is, you know, I was I was brought up in England, and I didn't come to this country until I was in my, until I was twenty years old. And one of the things I learned about America is that um, it, it it has a workaholic culture. Uh, I mean, people work extremely hard in the United States, and it's reflected in the fact that, you know, the amount of vacation time um, is, is so much less than certainly any other developed country by a long way. So there's this propensity to always be doing. And, uh, you know, it's one of the successes of America, of course, and uh, part of that. But there's a downside to that culture, and that is that sometimes to let go and relax allows new creative thoughts to bubble up, mm -hmm. uh, some of which are rubbish, but occasionally great ideas emerge that way. And so I, I've allowed myself that and not been concerned when I'm not working. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's hard in a culture where, you know, there's this propensity to always work. So that's also, that's part of my regimen, so to speak, mm -hmm. is not to be concerned when, you know, I don't feel like working now. I'm, I'm stuck on this. Okay, I'll sit down and do something else, read the newspaper. And of course, these days, look at the, you know, New York Times or something on the web or whatever. Mm -hmm. Look at, uh, watch a football match. I'm a great, uh, I'm a um, huge fan of soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up playing it and I... Mm -hmm. My fantasy when I was a young man was that I wanted to be a great soccer player. It turns out I'm, I'm barely, you know, I'm competent <laughs> at best. <laughs> I was competent. Uh, but so, but I've, I've enjoyed watching it. And I allow myself to do that. And what is interesting is that that often has very positive consequences that while watching the game, all kinds of ideas pop in my head and so on because I've, I, this kind of relaxation. Yeah. Um, now, one of the things I do do now in recent years that is part of a, um, a sort of um, regimen is that um, after breakfast in the morning, I scour the web, which surprises me. Um, you know, I do read newspapers. I have all kinds of people send me all kinds of stuff. I'm on all kinds of you know, things from Silicon Valley and various companies, some of those newsletters. And um, I, I sort of um, scanned a lot of those. And I found that um, it's sort of impressionistic. And those impressionistic images remain with me if they're important unconsciously and they pop up. Hmm. And so I found that to be actually quite useful. You know, I don't make, I don't sit there with a notepad making notes, oh, look up, you know, to remind myself, or or I don't even, um, you know, bookmark something on the web. I just allow my mind, again, 
to um, do it again impressionistically. And I found that um, you know, even though it's my memory may not be quite precise, uh, if it's important and it fits into something that I've been thinking about consciously, my sort of unconscious takes over and pops it in there. So I found that hour or so in the morning, sometimes it can be even longer to be very important. But otherwise, I'm rather undisciplined, may I say. I, I do what, you know, um, what, what I feel is important at the moment, uh, writing, trying to finish off a calculation, write a paper, uh, um, interact with one or two of my collaborators, and so on. So none of, I don't think this is very good advice to anybody, frankly. I think it's, it's very idiosyncratic and uh, uh, well, uh, as they say, the proof is in the pudding, and the book is excellent. So um, there must be something to this: giving yourself time to relax and le yeah. letting the mind wander. I found for me, um, going to the gym actually was one of my just regiments I had in life. But when I started writing more. I began having, I guess I just started paying attention to my thoughts in the gym and I would often get these kind of breakthrough ideas or perspectives sure. um, at an accelerated rate when my blood is pumping. Uh, there's something about, I guess, movement that. that yes. Is, and I think that's my analog to, you know, I'm, I, I don't work out anymore really. And I don't, but I hike. I do yeah. go. And, and it's the analog of that. I think it's, yeah. it's quite similar to that. And so if I'm working on a problem, um, I, I find I'm thinking about it sort of semi-consciously mm -hmm. um, as you walk. Because one of the things I've learned to respect is the role of the unconscious or yes. subconscious, um, you know, uh, at work. Um, it's continually at work, and it pops things up surprisingly. Uh, and, and pay attention to those. Some of the, you know, it's the same thing that sometimes, you know, when I'm working extremely hard and I'm stuck on something, uh, you know, I end up having, uh, you know, waking up in the middle of the night and then I start thinking about it and I try to work it all out in my head. And um, most times it turns out when I think about it in the morning, I realize I got it completely wrong. Mm -hmm. But it's all part of the process. You know, it's all part of this uh, um, uh, um, sort of a drive to understand and to get one's arms around whatever the problem is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yes, one of the things I should have said, one of the things I think that uh, um, is, is very common among physicists, I think, is that um, to hold the problem in your head sort of always there. I don't know, it's almost like a, maybe it's part of Zen philosophy, I don't know, but <laughs> I'm not a Zen practitioner at all, but I have that image that, you know, when I'm struggling with something, it's always there. It's uh -huh. sort of, I can feel it sort of right here in the front of the lobe, desperately wanting attention and I need, to, you know, and I'm working at it. And that can go for months. I mean, that, that process can continue for months until it's solved. That's yeah. Very interesting. I've, Somewhat you know, the image of a Doberman, you know, grabbing hold of something <laughs> and just, you know, not letting go. I found that when I'm writing a particular piece, I like to give myself at least a couple of weeks, even with the edit process, because you just, whatever the topic is, just holding the topic in your mind. Yeah. And you're either reading or editing every day for a couple of weeks. You, it keeps refining, right? You keep getting deeper yes. on whatever it is. So. It's hard to rush. It's hard to rush. I think a good written piece. Yes, yes, and and I think I think that's a that's very important. That's part of my sort of I try to describe it as sort of relaxing the mind, mm -hmm. but it is being patient mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, having a certain patience and realizing that there's a time scale. There's kind of developmental time scale mm -hmm. that's appropriate to the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Sometimes, you know, I mean, and, and not not feel, not get overly frustrated by the fact that uh, one is struggling and not really understanding and so on. There is a, a developmental time um, as this thing evolves in one's mind and yes. or on, on paper. Yeah, and I guess the bigger the idea, the more time is appropriate. Yeah, sure. Let me ask you one other thing. Are there any particular 
tools, linguistic tools or word processing software or any technology that you really like to use in the writing process? Uh, well, in writing a, the book, I use Word. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't use Word. I don't like Word. I think it's, I mean, I, I don't want to <laughs> get in trouble here. But uh, I, I, Word is terrible, in my opinion, frankly. It tries to, because it, it, it imposes so much on you. It doesn't give you freedom. So in my professional work, as a thing for my writing, um, I use um, LaTeX. Uh, which is, I don't know how many of your listeners may not be so familiar, but it's, uh, it's a fantastic uh, uh, platform, really, for writing manuscripts, technical manuscripts. That's mm -hmm. why, because you can write mathematical symbols and you can uh, get the, the, you know, the outline of the, um, you know, you can typeset extraordinary, mm -hmm. you know, make, it, make your document look, you know, beautiful, actually, mm -hmm. if you clever enough in doing it, it has, and you have control. That's the point. Mm. You know, you, you make the commands and uh, it's, uh, no, it's, it's, it's very powerful. And uh, so I use that in my technical work and my collaborators use it and we use that. And then we, you know, we use, we do use Google Docs and we use um, uh, other platforms like that to collaborate and they're very useful. That's with collaboration to work on the same document together. Right. And, and are you that's using that's been a great that's that's been great actually. Are you using the LaTeX software you described to create the charts and graphs that are in, say, the book? You slides? can. I'm not I I'm unfortunately I'm not good at that anymore. I used to be. I used to be quite good. But um I, I've become lazy and the packages such as they are have improved enormously and more sophisticated. And I hate to admit this, but I've left it up to my brilliant young colleagues to do the, uh, <laughs> the tables and the graphs and so on. Now, I've become, um, you know, I've taken advantage of age, maybe, to, uh, to let go of that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, okay, that's very all very helpful. Let me ask you one last thing on this topic, and we can move on. How do you approach reading? Um, I find myself buying more books than I could ever read. I almost have like a, a problem with books. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I don't think it's bad to own a lot of books that you don't necessarily read all of, <laughs> but I, yes. it, it does seem, I don't know. I at least personally seem to be ordering more books than I'm actually reading. So my, my pile of unread books keeps expanding. Right. I don't know if yeah. you have a regiment or a routine or, or how do you approach reading? And yes, general? I have the same problem. And I suspect, many, I suspect many people do. If you look, you know, my the, the side table next to the, my bed, <laughs> it's piled high with <laughs> books partially read or unread and so on. Uh, and I too have that problem. Um, I do order too many books. I've tried to stop doing that. Um, I do read them. I don't, I, I read on um, uh, my iPad, I mean, on Kindle, basically. Uh -huh. um, I do read, uh, but I don't like that. I much, I'm, I'm still, um, I, I much prefer uh, the sort of three-dimensionality uh -huh. of, a, of a book, of an old-fashioned book. Um, but I do, um, I'm not, one of the things I've learned, I've discovered in the last two or three years, I'm not reading as much as I did. Mm. And some of it is partly because of the reaction to this feeling of being overwhelmed. Um, and so it's, it's, a ba it's bad what's happened, to tell you the truth. I feel there's many interesting things. And so I find I get frozen a little bit. I go to read one thing and I think, oh, I should have been reading this and so on. So I'm not very good. I'm not a very good model, to be honest. But I, and, and one of the problems is with these books next to the bed is that um, I used to have a kind of dictum for most of my life um, that um, if I started a book, I would finish it, uh -huh. which maybe was a bit silly, but I always did. I would really try to finish it to see what this person said or how this novel ends. Uh -huh. um, and, um, uh, and that's sort of got in the way in the last two or three years because of the, just the number of books. And it's kind of um, 
and I've sort of reacted by reading less, ironically. So um, uh, it's a bit disappointing. Uh, but there are a lot of books. The other, there's another, another thing that has happened, and I'm guilty of this, and that is um, one of the other things that I think has developed in the last years is books have become too long. I know that's a funny old thing to say, <laughs> but, um, you know, books seem to me used to be, uh, you know, two or 300 pages, fine. Now it's sort of four or 500 pages. And uh, often I find that the books um, are a bit repetitive, you know, as you go through. I, I'm thinking of, I don't want to, because I like this, these books from uh, Stephen Pinker, is I think guilty of this. Uh, he, I, I like his work tremendously. He's extremely good, um, and he touches on some very important subjects. But I find uh, you know the, the, the book, five hundred pages, it could have been two hundred as far as I'm uh, concerned. Right. And I get so I, I I don't need to pick on him in any way. It just came to mind. Um, so, uh, but I do find that that is inhibitory too. Mm -hmm. that many of the books are now too long, so to speak. Um, you know, it be, and the idea is, you know, I've got the idea and the idea gets developed and then it sort of asymptotes and sort of, uh, you know, I don't learn much more, even though I'm wading through another couple hundred pages. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. And, um, uh, that, yeah. And as and I that, say, I'm guilty of that because this book that I wrote <laughs> Was uh, was you know when I signed the contract, was we agreed uh, I forget how many words, but it came to you know two hundred and fifty pages. Yeah. And indeed, when I um, when I started writing it, I totally freaked out at the idea of two hundred and fifty pages. I thought there's no way I'm going to write more than a hundred pages. You know, this is going to be you know this can be so embarrassing. And then I started writing, and it yeah. turned out to be four hundred and fifty pages. Yeah. And and I actually had to cut out from that. That book could have been 600 pages. So, right. you know, and I probably, you know, I'd be guilty as uh, what I'm accusing Stephen. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, this is a, this is a, but it's a bit of an issue, actually, I find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you, um, Sorry, I said one last question, but now another one's occurring to me. Do you <laughs> so you write? You see, you mentioned that you write kind of nine to noon or whatever, and then yeah, what, do you try to you do try to just write for a period of time, and then when you get to a certain point, you start editing? Because I know you mentioned if you're oh, editing as you go, yeah. that clearly slows you down. Or you yeah, I'm editing you know? as I go. That, that, I, that's a good way of saying it. Yeah. What 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 I was told by all the professionals basically in that language do not edit as you go so to yeah. speak let it be you'll come back and do that i discovered i can't do that and what i the way i wrote that book was i edited you know as i went along I mean, wow and that's what inhibited me in terms of some days only writing you know just two or three sentences right because yeah. i was continually editing and re-editing and rewriting it throwing it out, and then I'd say, that's wrong anyway. And I, I got into that a little bit. Um, uh, so, uh, and I found that works for me. And by the way, I do that in my professional papers, my academic papers. Mm. Um, it's the same thing. I've always done that. And maybe that was the problem, that a habit of 30, 40 years of writing academic papers in that mode mm. uh, of, of editing as I moved along, um, I wasn't able to break. Yeah. And be a bit more relaxed about. It. And so I did edit as I went along. And that meant that progress was much longer. But it did mean that when it came to, you know, at the end, I actually had very little editing. Wow. To be honest. And yeah. it was, uh, um, you know, I was, I did have, I had a very good editor. Um, at uh, Penguin, who published the book. I had the, the, the senior editor who was terrific. Um, but uh, and he helped, and I would send him chapters every once in a while. And then I also had, <laughs> which was fantastic, the, the writer Cormac McCarthy. 
Oh uh, yeah, he's a Alfred, great writer. Alfred, yeah, Alfred uh, read it my book, even though you know he's not a scientist, yeah. but he's a great writer. Yeah, and uh, that was great. We had lots of arguments. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, some were about the way I express things, of course, but most were about uh, grammatical things, especially about commas and semicolons. He hates semicolons, and I love them. So oh, that was really? continuous, almost became almost a running joke between us. <laughs> but uh, but it was great. It was great. That was so that was important. Sort of as I got into it, to have both of these people um, editing and giving me some feedback that I wasn't going way off track. Now, how did you stumble upon that? He just reached out and offered to help edit oh, your Cormac? book. Cormac, ah, no, well, Cormac. <laughs> So most people don't know this. Cormac is actually part of the Santa Fe Institute. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> He's fascinated by scientists. He loves scientists. He always has. And um, part of the re and he lives in Santa Fe. And part of the reason, a major reason, that he moved to Santa Fe was because he became good friends with uh, uh, Murray Gilman, great physicist, who mm. was one of the founders of the institute, and uh, lives here. Um, and um, would come in on a regular basis to the institute and attend talks and so on, mm. and was sort of part of the community. I mean, uh, a bit of an outlier, of course, since he's not actually a scientist, mm. but was part of the an, an inter integral part of the community. Wonderful! And that, wow. was, that was great fun, and he's he's a, a remarkable man. His his health is not good at the moment, sadly, and not. Uh. I will go, I will, probably Wednesday, I'm going to go see him again. Uh, but, um, uh, so that was great. So that's how, so it became very natural, you know, we, because we talked about writing a lot. Uh -huh. uh, funnily enough, just on that subject, the other person that was, uh, when I was writing this book, was around the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, um, for, oh, he must have been five, at least five years, was Sam Shepard. Okay. Um, the, the writer, actor, and so on. And uh, he did not edit at all, but I would discuss the act of writing with him and so on. And that was very interesting. That's great to have such good people around you. Yeah, no, it's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And I would very, I consider myself very fortunate that that was just, you know, accidentally these guys happened to be around. As yeah. I say, Sam was more just in the big picture about. What is the act of writing and the act of creation and right. so on? Not not specifically. He was less. Sam was much less interested in science. Cormac mm -hmm. actually was, is, has this uh, has a sort of passionate interest in science and fundamental questions. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I appreciate all that. I'm thinking. I mean, I am writing, but at some point, I'd like to write a book. But I'm still kind mm -hmm. of. Uh, figuring out how exactly to do that <laughs> so yeah it's hard it's very hard i mean i for several years i was i mean i was very uh, flattered that um you know um, publishing houses and, and so on and uh were, were asked me invited me to write a book and i would say there's no way you know i can't i don't mm -hmm. think i'm um it's not the kind of thing i think i can do and part of it was because i recognized i'm not a natural writer Mm. Uh, I mean, most of the people I know that write are quite fluid in their writing. You know, I mean, that is, they just sit there and they write. Mm -hmm. And I always know that I, I can't do that. Mm. You know, even, I mean, I, I have a real problem with, uh, you know, the modern culture, the modern internet culture. I mean, I can't tweet. I can't even write writing emails. Um, I have, I write, obviously I write lots of emails, but you know, I, I sit down and think about them. So it's completely ridiculous, frankly. You know, I don't, uh, it, it's nuts. So I, sometimes I can spend half hour responding to an email because partly it was because I was trained to write letters as a young man. I grew up in England in a very right. classic, very, very disciplined, rigid education. And one of the things that we were taught to do was to write and write letters, believe mm -hmm. it or not. And uh, that somehow got ingrained in me. So to be, um, 
you know, to write a, a simple text message, which I, of course, I do, mm -hmm. um, is, is often a bit of a struggle. I think, gee whiz, that's, the grammar's wrong, and I should have put a period here. <laughs> you know, and when I receive them from my, even my children, and they write these ridiculous things, I think I, I chastise them for their lack of grammar and their informality, yeah. which is just a joke, of course. So but, all the, the perfectionism slows things down. The perfectionism, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, that's a problem. I mean, it's not, you know, I don't I don't pride myself in it. It's, uh, it is a problem, actually. It, gets, it can get in the way. Hey, everybody. As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, Consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. Yeah, well, there's trade offs, right? Because, you know, it's, it's also yeah. you get a very high quality product, presumably. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's, and that's what I'm interested in is yeah. being right. So, to speak. yeah, yeah, very good. Okay. Thank you for that okay. because I, I really appreciate that discussion. Um, so, let's talk. You know, I think we covered a lot last time from the book, but one of the key areas I don't think we got too into was growth, yeah. um, which is very fundamental to the entire thesis of the yeah. book. So I know this has a lot to do. We did talk a lot about, as you said, nonlinear scaling, whether it's sublinear or superlinear and how that manifests itself in different areas. Um and growth is something clearly we observe in biology, but there's also sort of different modes of growth in socioeconomic systems or cities or businesses. So where, where would we open the discussion on growth uh, in your mind? Well, I, it might be good to start with uh, uh, the growth of uh, in, in uh, biology, because we're, you know, that's obviously what we're most familiar with since we've done it. Um, and, um, uh, and, and it is, as you've already indicated, it, in its characteristics, it is different from the kind of growth that we see in uh, socioeconomic systems, or at least in some socioeconomic systems. So let, let's talk a little bit about growth in biology first and relate it a little bit back to what we discussed earlier in terms of the scaling phenomena and metabolism and so on. And um, the, the, the framework uh, for, for this discussion, I think, for thinking about growth, is to recognize um, that um, you know, when, you, when you metabolize energy, you, you eat, you metabolize energy, you send it through the networks in, in, your, um, in your body, and um, that energy um, it goes to the cells, and it sort of, in, in the biggest picture, it's allocated sort of between two different things. On the one hand, it's allocated towards maintenance, which means repairing damage that's done, or if a cell has died, to replace it with another. Uh, and that's on the one hand, that's maintenance, generically speaking. And on the other hand, it allocates it towards growth, to adding new stuff. New, uh -huh. new cells, new biomass uh, to whatever the system is. And um, uh, you can express that in mathematical terms. And um, what you discover is when you write that out mathematically, that, uh, and you can actually solve the equations, 
what you discover is something very satisfying that um, the growth curve that comes from that, the, the prediction for how the system should grow is uh, what we call sigmoidal, which means you grow quickly at the beginning and then you stop growing, which is what we've done. Mm. And uh, the reason that you stop growing is because the supply of energy, your metabolism is, is scaling sublinearly. So uh, the bigger you are, the less is being delivered to the cell as you get bigger because mm. it's sublinear. On the other hand, the system is sort of growing linearly. It just keeps adding cells. Mm -hmm. And um, a sublinear behavior can't keep up with the linear growth, the, what, what is being demanded. Mm. So the, 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 the supply cannot keep up with the demand uh, and the system stops. I mean, it doesn't grow anymore. It just mm. reaches a stable configuration and that's who you are in maturity. And that's what these equations say. So, so in other words, the cessation of growth, the stability that we spend most of our life in, that is roughly this size, um, is uh, sort of guaranteed by the economy of scale that's built into metabolism. And that's expressed by this sublinear scaling with this three quarters power law for, um, for, it, for how it increases in size. So that's very nice. And um, we did a lot of work on that. And um, we showed that this, uh, this kind of scaling is sort of universal across all of biological life. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that turned out to be quite powerful. But of course, that's a, that's a bad uh, metaphor for um, socioeconomic growth, at least in terms of the economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, we, we, um, one of the great successes, of course, of, of the Industrial Revolution and the discovery of fossil fuels, and, or rather the, the exploitation of fossil fuels and the uh, parallel um, uh, evolution into a capitalist free market system, uh, which has led to all the marvelous things that have happened uh, that led us to this standard and quality of life. Uh, built into that is the idea of open-ended growth, that uh, mm -hmm. we, we need to have open-ended growth, and uh, that's integral to our system. And, uh, you know, I mean, if the, <laughs> you know, if, 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 if the GDP is not increasing uh, with a certain percentage every quarter, you're in trouble, mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of the image. And, um, and so, uh, so how does that come about in this? Well, it turns out, it's 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 really interesting. The same um, the same framework in biology can in fact be taken over to economies to mm -hmm. social systems in the sense that you can define something. And I think we did mention this last time: social metabolic rate or social mm -hmm. metabolism, which is sort of the analog to that. I mean, is that is all the various things that go into the metabolism of a city or an economy, um, um, you know, in, in everything from the material things that need to be introduced to drive the system, but also the uh, the ideas and so on, mm -hmm. but the social interactions that give rise to it. So that all goes into something that you could loosely call social metabolism or your social metabolic rate. Um, and... Um, uh, we have the same kind of template as we had in biology. That what happens? What 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 happens to that social metabolic rate? Well, again, it gets uh, in terms of the big picture allocated between two things. On the one hand, it maintains the system that's already there mm. by uh, repairing the roads and the buildings and uh, um, uh, and so on, but also the people, it has hospitals and doctors. So there's mm. a big maintenance piece that keeps everything going. Um, and then there's this other piece, which is the new growth. That is that you grow the, um, you, you grow new buildings and uh, you develop new roads and new areas and you expand the economy. So you can write that out as well. And here we have something quite different because what we learned 
from um, about social systems in particular cities is that they scale super linearly rather than sublinearly. Uh, so yeah. instead of the bigger you are, the less per capita, so you so that the supply in biology, which is decreasing uh, with size yeah. per cell, here, uh, in terms of as you increase in size, something fantastic is happening is that the superlinear behavior means you have more per capita mm. per individual, more and more. So you keep building on more and more. So not surprisingly, this system grows faster and faster the bigger it is. <laughs> and uh, in fact, it grows so fast that it's even faster than exponential. But it's at least exponential. And that's what we see. That's what we've seen so, you know, from uh, about 1800 onwards. We've had mm. this extraordinary expansion. Um, that is, uh, for the most part, been actually faster than exponential. Uh -huh. And that all is derived from superlinear scaling. And the superlinear scaling has its origins in the positive feedbacks in social networks that are, um, you know, both in the informal ones in terms of just our normal social interactions, but the ones that we formalize and encourage by having, you know, companies and corporations and universities and so on, which are designed to increase social interaction, to create new ideas, to innovate and create wealth. And, and, and this discovery um, from 1800 onwards took advantage of this marvelous machinery that we had evolved called the city, which is uh -huh. sort of the framework for doing that. And so, um, it, so we have this different kind of behavior, this uh, open-ended uh, exponential or faster than exponential growth. And that's been enormously successful. So this, this framework can accommodate on the one hand, the biology and the, the biological stability of growth. And on the one hand, other hand, the open-ended kind of innovative, wealth creative part of socioeconomic systems. Um, and, and that's what I talk about in the book. And so uh, growth and its various manifestations um, are all interrelated to the underlying network structures that constitute the system. Mm. And those are things that are quite different in biology than they are in the socioeconomic systems that we have evolved. Yeah, I think it's very useful the way you're describing. Um... It's a relationship between supply and demand, ultimately, that determines yeah. whether it's moving sure. sublinear or superlinear. Let me ask you, though, is it possible that the superlinear scaling we see in cities, is it possible that that has some limiting principle in it that we haven't encountered yet? Like, yes. um, I guess early the early stages of a life form typically are growing super linear for a time at least before it no flows. they grow uh, at the beginning they grow approximately exponentially okay and they look you know in fact at the beginning you would be hard pressed to tell the difference between mm -hmm. biology and social mm -hmm. uh, but and and it only evolves after a certain length of time when the um uh this uh, the sublinearity of the driving of the of the supply becomes more and more important and you mm -hmm. can't keep up with the demand. And in the other case, the in the economic case, socioeconomic case, the supply actually outstrips the demand. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it builds up more and more. Yeah. So you have these two opposite cases. So what is what does the city and this or the social system or city we're describing scaling super linearly? It, does it ever hit a wall or does this just yeah. so eat that's, the world? That, absolutely. So that is a number one question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is there an end to this? Mm -hmm. And uh, in this framework, the answer is potentially yes. And uh, there certainly is one in a limited sense, and that is to do with something called uh, a finite time singularity. Mm. Uh, because... Um, you, um, if, if, if you imagine, um, it, so this super linear behavior giving rise to super exponential growth, meaning something that's faster than exponential, um, has the following consequence that within some finite time, 
could be five years, 10 years, 100 years, um, whatever it is that you characterize the system by, it could be the GDP, could be uh, you know, the, the, the number of people, whatever, mm. it's going to become infinite, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. You can't have an infinite GDP, you can't have um, um, you know, an inf infinite number of patents being produced and so mm -hmm. forth. You can't have an infinite amount of crime, uh, whatever it is that is that is a socioeconomic metric. Uh, but what this says is that superlinearity uh, leads in terms of growth to a finite time singularity, uh, meaning it's infinite in some finite time. And the theory tells you what happens. It says the system will collapse. The system stagnates and then collapses. Um, and that, of course, is terrible. And the question is, how do you avoid that? How do you avoid the collapse of the system? And um, we've done that. We've done that. And the way to recognize how we've done it is to realize that this growth, this faster than exponential growth, has taken place within a given paradigm, within a given major innovation, mm -hmm. which has formed the sort of background culture to uh, what society is doing. So, um, and I think we did talk a little bit about this earlier, and that is that, you know, um, we discovered um, iron way back. Uh -huh. So we have something called the Iron Age, uh -huh. and, you know, which sort of set a certain cultural style and set a certain, um, everything was sort of revolved around the use of iron in some way. Uh -huh. and, and, uh, and then we, you know, and so one can imagine the Iron, we have the Stone Age, the Iron Age, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and in more recent times, of course, then the Industrial Revolution, the discovery of coal and the exploitation of coal. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, you know, ultimately the discovery of oil. And then uh, coming way up to modern times, um, the um, invention of the computer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and each of these is like a transition. A major transition, a major paradigm shift, a major innovation, which sort of sets the background for what everything else that's happening is somehow connected to it. And of course, now as we speak, that's uh, sort of the internet age, so mm -hmm. to speak. You know, that has, uh, in fact, superseded uh, the computer in some way, even though you obviously we use the computer. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, but the, the internet is sort of the dominant paradigm. Um, and by the way, in the same way that, you know, we don't live in the Iron Age, the Iron Age is gone, but we still use iron, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's right. still there, yeah. and so on, and, we still, uh, and so forth. So it's not that those things, you know, get become completely obsolescent. It's that they are superseded by something that's so overwhelmingly more dominant Right. And that new paradigm sets that tone. And now we're in the internet age. So the idea is that you avoid collapse. In order to avoid collapse, is that you must uh, make a transition to a new paradigm. You have to have a new mm -hmm. paradigm. And, uh, and another way of saying it is you need to sort of reinvent yourself at some stage mm -hmm. in order to avoid collapse. You need to. Um, you know, so to speak, start all over again in a certain mm. sense. Um, and, and that's what we've done. And, um, and it, it, in order to avoid the potential collapse um, in, 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 that is implied by this idea of this finite time singularity. And if you look at the data, uh, that's what we've done. So over here is a theoretical framework. It's a mathematical framework. Um, it's, of course, when we talk in the terms we're talking now, it's much becomes more speculative, obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, indeed, the data supports that. If you look at the data on major innovations, they pretty much follow the predictions of this theory. And the theory says uh, two very important things. It says that as you get bigger, uh, life gets faster. Things mm -hmm. speed up. But again, this positive feedback in the social mm -hmm. network speeds everything up. And certainly um, in my lifetime, things are so much faster now uh, than they were, you know, when I was a young man. Um, you know, the whole pace of life, you know, most everything I, I can think about 
has increased. Um, and, and the data strongly supports that. And one of the corollaries of that is that the rate at which you make innovations, or at least you make uh, this, this paradigm shift, has to increase. That is, the time between successive major paradigm shifts has to get shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. That's the price we pay for, so to speak, avoiding the singularity. Mm -hmm. And so um, going back to your original question, is there an end to this? Well, this would say that, uh, you know, the, the question is, if you're accelerating, if you have to accelerate the pace of innovation, or at least these major uh, paradigm shifts, um, eventually it's going to become not, you know, um, well, it was once hundreds of years between major, in fact, mm -hmm. at the beginning, thousands of years between um, major, this major paradigm shift. Now it's maybe, you know, 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, one can imagine if you follow this, this, uh, these predictions, it would only be 20 years and then 15 and 10. And it's kind of nutty after a while to think that we're going to have to have a major paradigm shift analogous to the internet, the IT revolution, sort of every five years. I mean, doesn't it's it's so um, so the question is, you know, does that persist or not? I don't know. This is speculative, um, but it does bring us to. Um, you know, something that I feel very passionate about, we need to be thinking about it. I mean, that's the message. Mm -hmm. We need to address this. I don't think we can continue willy-nilly just assuming that everything's going to turn out okay. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I think it's... <laughs> so far, it's been okay to do that. You know, mm -hmm. it just has its own dynamic and we just follow it and we do right. it. Um, but uh, I do think it's really important in terms of long-term sustainability of the socioeconomic system that we've all grown to, so to speak, profit from and love uh, to think about this and ask, you know, is it, is it really sustainable in its presence, in its present guise? Mm. And what do we need? I mean, do we need... And, and, by, and so what that brought up in my own thinking was to start uh, thinking about what the nature of innovation and paradigm shift is, because one of the things that has also evolved in the last, well, probably 25 years, is the word innovation has become synonymous with technology. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think of the word innovation, a new innovation, you usually think of something, you know, some new gadget, you know, an iPhone, iPad, mm. and whatever, electric cars, self-driving cars. Uh, that's the way we think of, of major innovation. But maybe we should go back to, uh, you know, a much broader idea about innovation, and that is a cultural innovation or a mm. social innovation mm. and so on. And, uh, and, and think about that and what that might mean in terms of the way we start to address these questions. So I don't know. It's it's as I say, I, I it's speculative, but uh, we do need to be thinking about it. Yeah, lots of great points there. Um, I guess one thing that jumped out at me is it seems like to your point where we get to iron and then we evolve past iron, but that doesn't mean we stop using iron, right? It's yes. almost like we've tapped a new technology or resource, but then we commoditize it right we make it as cheap and abundant as possible and after some amount of time by commodi by commodifying it frankly it becomes less of a problem or a concern right it's just we can now yeah. i mean i don't know the one example that always jumps to mind is light you know where we used to have to go and harvest the blubber of a certain type of whale or maybe it was the brain <laughs> matter i think to make the candles sure so each lumen was just super expensive but now light you know, we've, we've commodified light, so it's very cheap. Um, but so we, we build on these technological paradigms towards new paradigms, frankly, right? Like the iron age yeah. is a necessary prerequisite to the digital age, along with a lot of other paradigms, I'm sure stuffed in there. Um, 
And so maybe another way to look at this, and this gets to that, the I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, the Kurdishev scale, where it talks about civilization advancing in terms of how much energy it's harnessing or importing. Right. But to your point that we talked about last time, that necessarily means if we're importing or harnessing more energy, we're also creating more entropy. So is sustainability then, does it primarily involve intelligent exportation of entropy? Like we want to harness more energy, but then we're creating more entropy. So it's like, what do we do with this mess? You know, and it's almost maybe back to the point of maintenance, right? It's like the organism is taking in energy, but it's been damaged by existing, you know, energy or entropy has affected it. So it has to repair the entropy, the damage from entropy before it can allocate energy to towards growth. Um, so sorry, that was a mouthful, but I guess, is that the proper way to think about sustainability? That it's like, how do we deal with the entropy we're creating from harnessing more energy? Well, it, it's one dimension of it. It's one major component of it. Um, uh, that is, um, you know, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that um, in creating this extraordinary order, we necessarily have to create uh, a certain amount of disorder. Uh-huh. And uh, in, in a certain sense, uh, what that tells you is that, um, first of all, there's always going to be, so to speak, some sense of pollution, uh-huh. some, uh, you know, uh, some detritus that we're going to have to deal with. And, um, you know, until probably uh, well into the 20th century, this was not an issue. And in fact, we were quite happy in, um, you know, for example, mining coal, creating enormous slag heaps that no one cared about, that uh, eventually end up, you know, ruining rivers and streams and so on, you know, it has all kinds of, uh, you know, second and third order effect, uh, deleterious effects. Um, So, um, and somehow it was always sufficiently localized in, especially in space, but also in time, that it became it was not a major issue, um, and uh, but as we've more and more urbanized, and now that, um, for example, in the developed world, eighty percent or more of the population lives in urban areas, and the population has continued to increase uh, exponentially, um, the the impact is now becoming enormous. And that's why there is this whole question of its impact on the environment and almost nowhere is free of this. Mm. And so the, the, the way of thinking about it, I think, is that to accept the fact that we're going to be creating, to use the word entropy, entropy, which is mm. some form of pollution, if you like, mm. um, is to minimize that. Is obviously we need to minimize that Uh, We can't get rid of it, but we need to minimize it. We need to think very carefully about that uh, and how to do it. And I think one of the things from a physicist viewpoint, let alone just a citizen viewpoint, is the move towards renewable energy is the recognition that uh, the problem that you have with entropy is if you have a closed system. Mm. If the system is closed, I mean, that's where the, the second law of thermodynamics applies to a closed system. Mm -hmm. And one of the, and we discussed this earlier, and one of the unfortunate, um, unrecognized consequences of uh, using fossil fuel was that we effectively made the planet uh, now into a closed system. That is, we were using the energy that's part of the system to drive the system. Mm. Rather than what had happened up till then, up to about 1800, mm. we used energy that was coming from the sun. All of, everything around us, in terms of its um, evolution, growth, its dynamic, was driven by the sun. Mm. Uh, and uh, beginning in about 1800, and the exponential rise of socioeconomic systems, more and more, it was driven by, you know who we are on the surface of the planet. It was closing it, making it a closed sphere. Mm. And so I think part of the the, the drive towards uh, renewable energy is to recognize that we want to uh, make it an open system again. 
Mm. Let's open it up. And so we can relieve ourselves of the constraints of the second law of thermodynamics and not have this um, entropy being produced at this enormous rate by opening it up and using what, the, what, what made the planet in its, uh, you know, whatever it is, 11 billion years of existence, what it is, the sun, and uh, driven by the sun. So, um, you know, that's an extraordinary challenge, by the way. That's it's highly non-trivial uh, of itself, just technologically, um, you know, to get the entire planet that way. And part of the, uh, the, the struggle is the obvious one that we're facing now is to transition, is the transition from uh, fossil fuel to that. Uh, but at the same time, and I'm, I'm personally, um, you know, quite, uh, open to the idea that we go on, obviously we have to go on using fossil fuel because that's what we're all geared towards. Uh, and, but at the same time to develop ways of minimizing uh, some of the effects of, of the use of burning of fossil fuel. Um, so, um, you know, if we have a, uh, a coordinated effort, we can get through this, I think. I think that's not uh, an issue um, long-term. It's that, uh, you know, in the end, and this is something I don't know if I expressed it earlier, but, um, you know, you can do all the science you want to and you can, you know, we can develop all our modeling and our theories and so mm -hmm. on. But in the end, this is a political problem because the, the decisions are going to have to be made collectively. And that means it has to be made by political processes. So the question is, you know, uh, do people want this? And uh, can we educate people enough so that they will get behind it and move towards it in a coherent way and, uh, you know, without battling each other. Hmm. And uh, that's a political question. And, uh, you know, at the moment, it doesn't look very good. But, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, there's, a, you know, I'm, despite my general, I don't know, uh, <laughs> serious concern about the future, uh, I'm, I'm sort of an optimist in the sense that um, uh, human beings eventually, it's not that we'll find a way by accident or willy-nilly, but we are smart and I think we can come to terms with this. So I'm very hopeful that despite the extraordinary divisions and the, and the, and the sad polarization that we see, uh -huh. I mean, not just here in the United States, but around the world, uh -huh. uh, that we can come to terms with this. And, uh, but I do think uh, we, but, but just one last point before I finish with that, um, we do have to recognize that um, uh, and respect the role of science and scientific thinking. It's not that it's always right, but it's been so powerful in the past. And, and, and to recognize that, you know, we wouldn't be doing this uh -huh. You know, you and I right. communicate. There you are in Hawaii. Here I am in Santa Fe. And look, we can see each other. We can communicate. It's, it's extraordinary. It's not always it's miraculous. Right. It um, but it wouldn't have been had there not been all the basic research. Yeah. You know, Maxwell's equations and so on. I mean, mm. without that, none of this would have happened. And it's, uh, you know, um, there's a, an apocryphal story. It's sort of related to that. So those that don't know, um, James Clark Maxwell was a 19th century physicist who was a remarkable man. He's, he, it's a shame that somehow his name isn't up there. He is among physicists, but sort of with you know, Einstein and Newton and so on. But he was the man that unified, that rec unified the equations of electricity and magnetism Huh. into something called electromagnetism. Uh -huh. In so doing, unbelievably and remarkably, he predicted electromagnetic waves. Huh. Uh, now, none of the modern world would exist without the recognition of electromagnetic waves. I mean, that's what we're doing. That's uh -huh. what, you know, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates would be, uh, you know, earning $100,000 a year rather than worth, worth $100 billion or more, $200 billion, whatever uh -huh. it is, without electromagnetic waves. They owe James Clark Maxwell <laughs> enormous <laughs> amount. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I'm so, it's a bit of a cartoon version of it. But um, 
but you know, it's it's incredibly important to recognize that 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 basic research led to this extraordinary um, uh, consequences for for society. Right, and um, I think society needs to recognize that and to trust in it. It's not that it's always right because that's yeah. the nature of science, but it's had profound consequences for good and for evil. It led yeah. us also to the atomic bomb, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, which has also been good and bad. Right. Um, but um, to recognize that and support it and to um, integrate it into the sort of general culture. And we haven't done that. Despite that, so here's the story. I just want to tell you about Maxwell before I finish. Yes, please. My polemic on this. So James Clerk Maxwell became famous um, in the 19th century. He did all this in the in the last part of the 19th century, and um, Queen Victoria asked to meet him, and um, he came to Queen Victoria, and Queen Victoria said to him, "You know, Mr. Maxwell, I've heard all these wonderful things about you and the wonderful work that you've done." and the science that you've done and about the, you know, electromagnetic waves, which I don't understand and so on. But tell me, what use is all this? I mean, it sounds wonderful, but what use can it be? Mm. And he said, Madam, I have absolutely no idea what use it will be, but one thing I can tell you is that your ministers will be taxing it. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was, <laughs> which of course has been true. Mm. And, uh, so, you know, I do think we do have to recognize that. And, I, and one of the reasons I wrote my book um, was to just sort of try to get across the power of thinking scientifically and the potential fantastic consequences for society if we do. And I think we do, we, 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 we need leadership to really promote that. So I'm sorry, that's my polemic. No, I, I'm, I, I really enjoyed that, actually. Um, I like how he spoke directly to her pocketbook, you know, just to get her to take it, take the entire enterprise yeah, seriously. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It is. No, exactly. Um, and, you know, further to your point, it's not like it's always right or succeeds. In fact, it's quite the opposite, right? We have probably 99% of ideas that are generated are wrong. Yeah, right, absolutely. And we're just, you know, disproving them left and right. But every now and then we find a, a diamond in the rough or something like that. Well, it's, um, it's an iterative process. I think yeah. that's the, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, if you look at the scientific journals, uh -huh. um, uh, you know, if you looked at all those papers, uh, most of them have, had, have been inconsequential. Uh -huh. and many have been wrong. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's an iterative, corrective process, yeah. an evolutionary process, and um, it's led to marvelous things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we need to be cognizant of that. But we do have to recognize um, that it's uh, much of it is going to not be um, useful or right. Right. And sometimes something is kind of like falls by the wayside for a long, long, long time, yes. right? It may just Absolutely. be inconsequential for hundreds of years even until we have some other breakthrough that recognizes its prescience. Um, it's really interesting. So let me try to, let me ask a question here. I, when you say we converted, I guess the world from an open system to a closed system, this was the transition point of instead of living off of the energy flows of the sun or biology or animal power, whatever is like, whatever energy is just flowing, we started to tap into energy stocks, which were like oil exactly. and hydrocarbons. Exactly. Is that the transition point from open to closed yes. system? Okay. That is it. But we, we and, I, and I, I should have said that, that's the right language. The energy in fossil fuels is the sun's energy. I mean, mm -hmm. that is the energy from the sun, but right. it's been, you know, it's built up over the last several millions, hundreds of millions, in some cases, mm -hmm. years, um, that has been stored there mm -hmm. um, on, on the surface of the planet, or just under the surface of the planet, mm -hmm. um, in, in hydrocarbons. Um, the, the uh, you know, basically um, dead biomass yeah. uh, just sitting there, ready to be ignited. 
Mm. Um, and it has an, you know enormous amounts of energy. I mean, mm. uh, obviously, um, but what it meant, um, you know, unbeknownst to us, so to speak, that um, no longer using that flow from the outside, that mm. now it was as if you were putting, um, you know, um, encasing the earth. In, right. in some sphere itself and saying, well, now this system is just going to be self-propelled. Mm. And, um, you know, that leads to all sorts of, you know, bad problems uh, long-term. Right. And it's the production of all the entropy by that burning. Uh, whereas you, if you use the sun, you mitigate that tremendously. Yeah. And you have that energy flowing in um, and uh, you don't have the same kind of uh, residue from the burning of hydrocarbons. Right. So it's, uh, it's a way of what I was talking about earlier, of, of truly minimizing um, the entropy uh, mm. that's produced by the use uh, even of um, energy from the sun. So renewable energy would then be shifting us back towards utilization of the flow, right? Of Solar, flow. Yes. wind, exactly. tidal energy, whatever it may be, which produces exactly. commensurately less entropy because you're using yes. energy that's raining onto the earth, so to speak. Right. Is there another mode here where, say, we continued utilizing hydrocarbons, but somehow figured out a, a technologically sophisticated an economically efficient way to export, say, the pollution into space or something like that. Um, could it go either way, or do we definitively need to go towards renewables? Well, no, I, I uh, you know, I wouldn't rule out. I mean, it's, I'm not uh, an expert in it, but mm -hmm. of course, people have been trying for a long time to uh, find ways of, uh, you know, that's carbon storage, basically. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, you know, how can we? Uh, store the um, you know the pollution so to speak or the the useless energy that is left over the entropy uh, from uh, um, using this energy in a useful way how do we do that mm. and uh, you know there hasn't been on a grand scale successful ways yet developed for doing that mm. that doesn't mean to say it's impossible you know, people have thought about storing it in deep, deep in the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, are there clever ways that you can use it to um, encourage uh, greater growth of forests? Because mm -hmm. that's the storage of carbon. Right. That is the storage. Can you do that? And, uh, you know, I'm, I mean, President Trump, I think, made this uh, comment, yeah, we should grow more trees. Mm -hmm. And indeed, that's correct. I mean, if we could, if we could do that in a fast enough, efficient way uh that would be one way but it's tiny on the scale of, of what we're producing now and 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 by the way it's the sad thing is that um you know if if we'd have realized this in 1900 rather than 2000 <laughs> uh, uh you know and and really thought about this um after 100 years of the industrial revolution um, you know, we might be, maybe we would have developed ways of circumventing some of these problems mm. and the urgency uh, of it would, would be much less. In fact, maybe we would have solved that problem. Mm. We would have found ways of sort of recycling, mm. so to speak. And, uh, uh, but I, uh, but the, my emphasis, like many others on uh, you know, especially solar or wind or, or wave power, uh, is partly because we left it so late in the day to really come to terms with it um, that there is an urgency, and this is the uh, this seems to be the quickest, most efficient way in which we can really uh, you know save the planet, so to speak. Mm. So. Um, you know, and it's painful. It's extremely painful uh, mm. to try to do that. And mm. it's crazy. You know, here I am. I live in New Mexico. Um, and, um, uh, you know, where the sun shines, I don't know, probably 300 days a year. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, in a way, it's sort of crazy that we're not all using 
solar energy to the mm. you know, it's absolutely loony that I, I mean, I hate to admit it, I don't have solar panels all over my roof. Mm -hmm. You know, I should have zero electric bill. Right. Um, in fact, I should have zero energy bill. Right. Um, in, in a state like this. Um, you know, and uh, we don't do it. I mean, I'm, I'm looking down across a valley and there's a very fancy housing development down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just happened to be walking there yesterday, uh, looking at some of the new houses and so on. And only one house has any solar panels on it. Hmm. And uh, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. You know, but this, this is a tiny weeny piece of this, of course. Sure. Um, but it needs to be done on a massive scale. Uh, but I, I, going back to your question, yes, of course, we should also be putting um, huge amounts of um, resources into trying to mitigate the problems of the burning of hydrocarbons, no mm -hmm. question. And uh, it may be that someone will come up with a very clever way of storing that energy or recycling it in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and indeed, some have been done. You know. Um, uh, I, I think in Scandinavia, right, they uh, they tried to use um, a water that's been heated in power plants to heat homes. You know, mm -hmm. you sort of use that. That that water in the past was just sent out and dumped into the uh, environment, mm -hmm. causing all kinds of problems. But they try to use it now as a heating mechanism for, for homes nearby. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of things you can do, and people are very clever. And... Uh, uh, you know, I think so. So I take a sort of um, a middle ground in a way. All of these things need to be done. You know, I, I mean, all of these things need to be done. And uh, I, I just think that we we need much more emphasis on dealing with that in order to forestall serious problems, you know, for our children and grandchildren, which are mm -hmm. going to be hitting us in less than 50 years. That's interesting. I'd like, I'll share this brief story that when I was living in Las Vegas, actually for a little while, which has a very similar climate to yeah. New Mexico, maybe not temperature, maybe higher temperature, no, it's but much higher, it's much higher temperature, than but 300 days of sunlight roughly yeah. per year. Yeah. Um, and there, there was a while I was living there between 2011 and 2016. And there was a while or during that period, um, solar companies were starting to boom there. There was a company called yeah. Sunrun, I think, and a few others, Oh yeah, yes. and uh, they were quickly getting solar panels on people's roofs because it made a lot of economic sense, as you said. Sure. But what happened was kind of interesting. That I think it was Warren Buffett or Berkshire, more generally, that bought Nevada Energy, which was like the local um, utility, the local power utility, yeah. and they, uh, I, I guess, through lobbying or something, basically had the law changed to where the amount of solar power you could sell into the grid, either they reduced the rate or the amount that was allowed oh, to yes. be sold. There was some legislative yeah. change that all of a sudden made solar panels on your roof not economic. So you had to go back to the monopoly to buy your power. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder, is that something similar in your area, that it's a legislative interference that's preventing well, people from... Here, I think, I think it, it's a continuous... It is, <laughs> it is a battle. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that uh, takes place here. But uh, I think so far, my understanding is that the, um, uh, you know, you become, when you put on solar panels, you become, of course, part of the grid. Mm -hmm. And uh, any excess, it goes back to the uh, utility company. It's called PNM here. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it goes back to them and they uh, give you a credit for that. And I think mm -hmm. that's still happening. And indeed, PNM itself uh, has committed to going solar itself, mm -hmm. ultimately. But they're still fighting exactly that battle that you mentioned in Nevada, mm -hmm. namely, well, we shouldn't, you know, we want to limit the amount that we have to take back, kind of thing, mm -hmm. because we're still using some coal fire, coal, coal burning plants, and so mm -hmm. on. So I think this is a very painful period, very difficult period. And I understand, you know, the, the economic forces are at work on both sides. Um, and, uh, but it does, you know, and it brings up all kinds of, you know, fundamental questions about um, 
the role of government. You mm. know, I mean, um, you know, how much should government interfere in this and force, you know, utility companies to do various things or, mm. or you know, both on the local level or state level or the federal level. And, uh, but one thing I, you know, so that's, that's a, you know, philosophical question with, with all kinds of practical implications. But um, one thing I, I, I'm, I guess in terms of my politics, I've always been enamored to varying degrees by a kind of Keynesian economic philosophy. Mm. And that is the um, using the tax, tax code, which of course most countries do, mm. to change social behavior in various ways, to coax people to do things. And of course, giving tax credits for solar is one of those. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's a very, you know, that's a soft way of government interference, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. without kind of imposing, you have to. Mm -hmm. kind of thing. I mean, I'm like, for example, in China, uh, you know, if you go to China, one of the things that immediately strikes you is everywhere you go, you see solar panels. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's because the government, in a certain sense, imposed that. Well, the American system, you know, that's, you know, it doesn't matter what you're, where you are in the political spectrum. I think you, we don't want that. We don't mm -hmm. want the government sort of uh, telling everybody you have to have this and so on. Mm -hmm. But to encourage people, so that's why I'm a sort of mild Keynesian in that sense. I like that mm -hmm. idea of, um, of uh, using tax incentives in one way or another, which we do all the time. For mm -hmm. I mean, we do that both in terms of individuals, in terms of companies. Mm 